Chance, I'm Rob, and today I have a guest that I am over the moon to talk to. It's been like literally 30 years since I've talked to him. It's a friend of mine from high school who is this amazing comic book dude or zine dude or publisher or creator. He's just an amazing artist. Uh, John Porcelino is with me. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You bet, man. I'm super excited. So, John, Tell us about yourself. Well, I've been I've been a cartoonist since I was a little kid, like a lot of cartoonists, making little things here and there. And uh, in the early 80s, I started making photocopies of my stuff, and that led me to where I am now, the late 80s. I started a zine called King Cat Comics, and it was just kind of a catch-all title for whatever I had going in my mind. So it was King Cat Comics and Stories, so it's... it's uh, kind of straddles the line between a zine and a comic. So, it's, it's you know, it's mostly comics. I consider myself a cartoonist. But if need be, there'll be some prose pieces in there, some little articles or, you know, odds and ends and things like that that are more zine-like. But I published the first issue in May of 1989, and I'm currently working on issue number 80. So the most recent one is uh, number 79, and that came out uh, at the end of 2019. So. When I started, my co- the, the King Cat was, like I said, a catch-all. So it'd be like some little slice of life stories, some articles, some funny stuff come out, cut out of the paper, some fictional comics and stuff like that. But over time, I began to focus more and more on straight autobiography and slice of life autobio. So my comics tend to be focused on like little moments in life uh, that kind of give a glimpse of the bigger picture of things uh, nowadays, but uh, I write a lot about nature and my domestic life, animals, hiking, birds, mm, human consciousness, (laughs) stuff like that nowadays. Yeah, it's really engaging stuff. And I mean, like I said, I've known you since I think we might have even met in junior high. I mean, it's been a long time. And uh I remember uh, I've I've still got on the shelf next to me here, I've got probably the first 20 issues of King Cat that I bought as they were coming out. And Uh I've always been a huge fan of your writing. I've been a huge fan of your art, too, because it's it's definitely your style, right? But your writing, you know, you, you mentioned that you do Slice of Life. I remember you would, I would read these and you would have like these obscure little stories from when we were in high school. I was never featured in it. It's not like these were about me. And I was like, oh, great. But I would I would read this and it's like, oh, yeah, I remember these people. And I remember like this guy being a jerk. And you call him out in there, but not in a mean way. You'd just be like, oh, yeah, you know, that jerk. And you would have this little drawing. And I'm like, that's totally him. And it's this little sketch. Like <laughs> you just captured reality in a way that 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 great cartooning does. So I, I, I have to say I really appreciated your stuff. And – um, I'm just really thrilled that you're still out there doing this. Although I do call you a zinester because you are from that world, man. Going to Kinko's at two in the morning to get the discount on on printing, stapling it yourself. I remember you getting reams of paper from your dad in high school so that you could put out your uh, put out Zozo, your original uh, that magazine in high school. You're you're that guy. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I'm a, like I said, I kind of have one foot in both worlds because I, I am a cartoonist, you know, and I love comics and I pay attention to that world. And I'm, you know, I'm published by a comics publisher and things like that. But you know, at heart, I'm a zine maker. Like I, I love the do-it-yourself aspect of it. You know, I, King Cat is. You know, still the same format that it was in 1989. It's uh, letter-sized paper folded in half and stapled in the middle, and it's still photocopied all these years later. And, you know, I think one thing that's interesting, because of that aspect of things, I've been able to generate a really close relationship with a lot of my readers, because when people order a copy King Cat, it's coming directly from me. You know, a lot, I mean, I've been doing King Cat for 30 years now, so 
you know, it's interesting to see. I mean, some people started reading King Cat when they were like 14 years old and they're, they're 40, 44 or 45 years old now, you know, and they've been following my work and all those years. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like I grew up with my readers, you know, so I'm really grateful for that. I, 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 I feel like I have a pretty unique relationship with my with my readers. Well, and your stories are really personal to you. Um, and, and like you said, you mentioned nature and that even reading, you, you had that one, uh, mosquito abatement man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it, let's be honest, not a lot happens in that story from a narrative standpoint, but it was completely engaging. I mean, I, I still remember that story because it was so engaging because it was so real. You know, I think that you really capture thoughts and human condition. I think it's, it's beautiful work. Thank you. I mean, the trick to autobiography in comics or yes, in general is, you know, a lot of people slag on autobio because it seems like it would be just really easy to do. Like, oh, the stories are already written. You just have to put them down on paper. But I mean, I, the, the trick to autobiography is that you're writing something that's very, very personal. But somehow the way you put it down on paper or get it across to other people there's a universality to it where uh, the reader can kind of put yourself in the writer, put themselves in the writer's shoes and, you know, relate on some kind of deeper level. And that's the magic of auto bio stuff. And, you know, how, how you do that is tricky and it's different for every artist that works in that form. But, you know, when it works, to me, it's still, it's just, it's so powerful and intimate and compelling. And so I'm grateful that people seem to be able to find <laughs> something compelling in those little stories about life, you know? Yeah, well, I, I know it's touched me. Um, I got a question. King Cat is is your book, but you're also a publisher, correct? Or are you still doing that? Well, I published a few things here and there. And um, I mean, in recent times, and, and I... I was more involved in that earlier. I, I published little zine chat books and stuff for people. The last couple of years, I, I published a book, this cartoonist, Jenny Zerbakis. She was from Chicago and ended up living in North Carolina, but she did a zine in the 90s. I mean, she's still doing it now, but she was most prolific in the 90s called Strange Growth. That was a comic that just, you know, there was one of the one of those ones that we were just talking about that just like hit me straight in the heart and her her stuff was really poetic and kind of gentle but also really kind of clear-eyed you know in a lot of ways her stuff was very very much ahead of her time and so you know it was one of my dreams that somebody would publish a collection of her stuff and it it became apparent that if if I wanted to have that book on my shelf I was probably going to have to publish it myself so we did that book a few years back I, I published a little um like one shot comic by Pascal Girard, who's a Quebecois artist up in Montreal. Up in, he's from Quebec City, but he lives in Montreal, and uh, he's one of my favorite cartoonists too. So he did a little comic that um, I helped distribute, and it was one of those ones where like I could never keep it in stock because I sold so many of them. So finally, he just sent me the files for it, and I had it designed up and and, and printed that. So I, I'd like to do more little things like that. But it, I, I'm a publisher just from my heart. It's not a business at all. So if I take on projects like that, it, it's it's something that has some kind of like deep personal meaning to me or some close connection with the artist. So I, I don't really consider myself a publisher so much. I, I guess I'm a self-publisher seriously, but the publishing aspect of publishing other people is kind of like, oh, something pops up and I feel like it's a good project and I could do something with it that the artist couldn't do themselves, then and, and I'll, I'll definitely think about it. So I've got some ideas about some future book publications that I'd like to do, but nothing, you know, that's way on the back burner. Sure, sure. Where can people find your work? Where can they find the things that you have published? Where Do you have just a, like a central website? Is it on DeviantArt? Where sure. do they get this? Well... Yeah, another thing that I've done for a long since 1992, uh, in 1992, I started a distribution company for small press comics called Spit and a Half. And that was kind of the, what I called my little self publishing efforts and stuff like that. I had a little record label and um, I helped distribute. I focus on mostly like art and literary comics, definitely small press, self published things. Um, 
and to a certain extent, international comics I try to bring over uh, that are in translation. So, um, you know, at this point on the website, on the Spit and Half website, I've got maybe 600 or so books online from all over the world. And uh, so that's kind of what I do as my day job, too. And it's, it's also a labor of love. It's just I love getting good comics into people's hands and hard to find comics and kind of more obscure things that uh, people don't really have much access to. So all that stuff can be found at bitandahalf.com including all my own work and stuff like that. It's all in one spot there. It's bit and a half. Now, do you have a, a Patreon or anything, ways that people can support you? Yes. Yeah, so a couple of years back, I started a Patreon and it was, I mean, it's completely changed my life. It, it's kind of tripled my income. So, you know, I was, I was one of those poor cartoonists. Like I was able to keep doing my work and keep focusing on my work, but it definitely took a lot of sacrifice in terms of financial stability and stuff like that. But, you know, I was fine with that. Um, My most important thing was just to be able to do what I want to do without having to compromise it or anything. So uh, a couple of years back, I started a Patreon, and that's been a a game changer for me. So um, I suppose it's patreon.com slash John Porcelino, but I think if if you just search me on Patreon, it, it should pop up. And for that, there's different levels. I, I do um, a lot of online stuff that's exclusive to Patreon people. And then there's also a level where you get that kind of stuff. And you also get physical stuff mailed in the mail. When I when I put out a new issue of King Cat or a little zine or, you know, I try to come up with little uh, physical uh, things to send to people, stickers and patches and zines and, you know, different odds and ends to to put in the mail to people uh, at that level too. So it, it's been fun. It's been just, I mean, it's helped me financially, but in another way, it's it's been a, a, a different way of really connecting with my audience and my readers and stuff. So it, it's been pretty fun. So do you ever take commissions online? Do, you, do people do, I, I'm not sure that how that works for you. I know a lot of uh, artists and cartoonists will do commissions to make a little extra. Do you ever do that? Is that part of your Patreon? Sure. It's not something that I really pursue a whole lot, but, um, you know, people will approach me about it. And so I, I always am happy to do drawings for people. I do a lot of like portraits, family portraits and pet portraits, especially. And turns out that I do a lot of like wedding invitations and things like that. Now, the one thing that's weird for for me that's different than a lot of cartoonists is I don't actually sell my original artwork like original page from King Cat or something. I I don't sell those, but I, I, so as an alternative, I do, people will, if they, you have a favorite page or something like that, I'll, I'll actually redraw it. And it's actually usually comes out a little bit nicer because I use really, I use nice paper to do the commissions on and stuff. Whereas King Cat pages could be drawn on the back of an envelope or something, you know? And so I'll, I'll do that for people. Um, You know, like I said, it's, I don't really advertise it too much, but if people are interested, I'm I'm definitely open to doing that stuff, and I, I try to keep it definitely very affordable. So I, I I my whole thing about making comics versus making fine art is that I like the accessibility of it, and I like the affordability of it, and the kind of uh, and anybody who wants my art can get it in, in, you know, for five bucks for a zine or whatever. And, um, so even with the original artwork that I do for people, commission artwork, you know, I, I try to keep it pretty reasonable. Yeah. I think commissions are just a good way to kind of stretch people right now while we have this pandemic and it's harder for get people to like get some of that physical stuff or to get into stores. So that's why I was asking. I thought, you know, if you have it great. And it sounds like that is an option. What do you think, with all these cons canceling and postponing, what do you think is the best way that people can support creators right now? Well, I mean, buying stuff from them, you know, That's an uh, obvious one, right? online, whether it's supporting their Patreon or going to their web store and picking up a few things and having it sent to you, certainly commissions would be great. You know, that, that's a, a, a great way of getting money in people's pockets. I think, you know, part of the whole thing that's been interesting to me as a self-publisher doing it this long is that 
I have a lot of gripes about the internet, but it certainly has made it easy to get in touch with people. It's made it easy to send a, just even an, an email saying, hey, man, I've, I've been reading your work for 20 years and I just wanted to say thank you for what you do. I mean, it sounds corny, but that kind of stuff means so much, especially uh, cartoonists. It's such a uh, isolated kind of sit at home at a desk and hash things out by yourself kind of art form that um, to get those little bits of encouragement and support from people means means a lot to cartoonists. So, you know, I wasn't sure how things would go with COVID when with my distribution service and things like that. And obviously orders for stores and stuff have dropped off a lot, but I'm staying very busy with people who are looking to get cool comics in the mail. And, you know, I, I the only real difference for me is I, I ship things once a week now instead of basically daily. So, so they have every, to wait a little I, bit longer. I, yeah, well, I'm just trying to minimize everybody's contact with the outside world a little bit. So I, I go on Friday afternoons and ship off that week's orders. And But, you know, so far, knock on wood, it, it's been uh, still pretty consistent. You know, ordering things online, dropping people a line, order a commission. It's it's so easy to get in touch with your favorite artists and, and connect with them at this point that, uh, you know, people, in the best of times, people appreciate it. And, and nowadays, it's it means even even a little more. So if this was a dream con, okay, who would you be most excited to meet? In the whole world? Yeah, man. <laughs> Alive or dead. It's it's your choice. However you want to slice that up. It's a dream convention. <laughs> oh, geez. That's, uh, God, I, I don't know. Jesus, how about that? I'd like to sit down and have dinner. I'd like to sit down and have G- dinner with Jesus and pick his brain about life. He'd have a few things to say, I bet. Okay, that's it. Hey, man, that's the first I've had. Well, for, I, but that'd I, be I, solid. I think, I think sitting down and, and getting uh, some answers straight from the horse's mouth, straight straight from the person who probably most impacted Western civilization would help answer a lot of questions about the direction of our society. Maybe I think, I think it would be helpful. (laughs) That's a good answer. I I, I I really want to be at the con that Jesus shows up at. That would be interesting. Yeah. If you're talking about cartoonists, God, I kick myself a little bit that I never met Jack Kirby because he ended up being such an inspiration to me, obviously, my comics are nothing like Jack Kirby's comics, but I I love so much the passion of what he does and the idiosyncrasies of what he did with comics. And, you know, I hear stories from people who met him at cons in the early 90s or late 80s. And, you know, I loved his comics at the time. I just didn't really realize who he was because I, I used to collect all of his uh, monster comics in the quarter bins you know, the seventies reprints where monsters, well, they, they reprinted all those Atlas age monster comics. And I just, I mean, I, those are still to this day, those are my favorite comics in the whole world, those Jack Kirby monster comics. So I kind of had an inkling of who Jack Kirby was, but I wasn't ever, I wasn't really into superheroes or, or any of that kind of stuff at that time. So I would have, I, I wish I had the foresight to have driven out to California sometime and knocked on his door. Cause I, I would have liked to have met him. See, you had two good answers, and nobody said Kirby yet either, but I would have thought he would have shown up. Oh, yeah. So, once again, <laughs> best way for people to get in touch with you is through your website. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you go to spitandahalf.com, I mean, I'm on. Uh, I'm not on all of it because it's so much now, but I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on, St- I'm on Tumblr, which, you know, I, I refuse to give up hope on Tumblr. Um, I'm on Instagram. I have uh, King Cat, uh, King-Cat. Dot net is my kind of basic king cat site, but the main, you know, ordering site and stuff is spitandahalf.com. All of that stuff has my contact information on it, and so I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. Great. And I will put all of that in the show notes. People can get in touch with you. People Great. can order stuff. And I really, really encourage people to do this. I, I can't tell you I what a big fan I am and how long I've been a fan, uh, not just because yeah, I know you. I been, I'm a zine guy. Like, I love zines, too. And yours always, yeah. always hit me the right way. So, thank you, John. Thank if you've you for got being those, If you've got those early King Cats, if you've got those early King Cats, that's a, that's a pretty uh, tight community because, uh, like, the first dozen or so issues, I, I, 
I made 18 copies of each one. Oh, you're you know? kidding. And I, it, I have those early ones. That, that my thinking, I think, yeah, my thinking was I had five or six friends that I'd give them to. I put three copies of it, you know, at the turntable or I think Graham Crackers. Kind of, that was later, though, but those first ones. And I, you know, I sold them through Fact Sheet 5. Fact Sheet 5 would list them, so I'd hope that I'd get a couple of orders and maybe it would take a six months or so to sell out of my print run of 18 copies. And then I do the, you know, I'd have the next issue. So there were very, very few of those early King Cats made, you know, so there's not too many of them out there. Well, I'm in a, uh, an elite club then because I do have. Yeah, them. there you go. Hold on to those things. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, once again, John, thank you so much for being on and uh, I'll get this out and I hope the world finds you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You can find Alley Chats on Facebook by searching for at Alley Chats. You can also visit us at our webpage, smgpods.com slash Alley Chats for links to all our episodes and other cool stuff. One easy way to support our show is to rate and review Alley Chats wherever you listen to your podcasts. Those ratings really help us out and help others find our show as well. Alley Chats is produced and edited by Rob Southgate for Southgate Media Group. Be sure to subscribe to Alley Chats because you definitely don't want to miss an episode. Thanks again to our affiliate sponsors, Hunt a Killer and Tweaked Audio. Links to them are on our webpage and in the show notes. This wouldn't be possible without them. Our theme song is by Benny and the No Goods. Check out their awesome music at bennyandthenogoods.bandcamp.com. If you're an artist or writer or creative type that would have a table at an artist alley and would like to be on Alley Chats, message us through the Facebook page or email us directly at southgatemediagroup at gmail.com and we'll set up an interview. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow with another fantastic show.